Welcome to the Change the Game podcast, where we are changing the game by doing business differently and highlighting stories of capitalism at its best. I'm Steve Baker, and here with me co-hosting is Rich Armstrong, president of The Great Game of Business and co-author of our new book, Get in the Game, How to Create Rapid Financial Results and Lasting Cultural Change. How are you, how are you doing, Rich? Good, Steve. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm probably just a little flustered because uh, I'm, I'm truly excited. I'm, I'm blown <laughs> away by the fact that we have a really special guest with us today. Some of our audience uh, have met Tanya at our annual conference. Tanya Morris is the founder and CEO of Simply HR Incorporated and uh, creates relevant and thought-provoking conversations regarding the new challenges in today's workplace. Things like communication divide, work ethics, employee retention, uh, rewards and maintaining a positive work environment. These are all really hot topics. She comes from a human resources background, uh, but has also researched and collaborated with uh, industry leaders and led focus groups to better understand the needs, behaviors, expectations, and career desires across multiple industries and organizations. Uh, Tanya is also consistently one of our highest rated speakers at the annual conference. And Tanya Morris, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much. It's good to be back among two experts. I'm excited. <laughs> you, you just keep talking because I like to <laughs> talk. So, you know, we when we think about the, the subject matter at hand, uh, diversity and inclusion comes up a lot. I just I want to point out that, you know, a lot of our listeners are uh, are entrepreneurs. And before we get into a lot of this, um, I'm curious, you know, you're an entrepreneur yourself. Uh, you spent a long time in the corporate world, uh, but you took the leap. Why did you take the leap and, and uh, what made you take that leap to start your own company? You know what? I'm glad you asked that question because I think it's so important, but I really, I had a good job. I had a good government job. I had no reason to leave. I had, what, nine weeks of paid vacation. I had a pension. I had everything, big office, good pay. I had no reason to leave, right? But I felt that the workforce was changing because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a life learner and I wanted to make impact. And I just thought that I see what's going on, especially when the millennials would start coming into the workplace and I would go to board meetings and executive leadership meetings because I was on the executive leadership team. And I would talk about this different generation that's coming into the workplace and no one knew exactly what I was talking about. I'm like, what, what is she talking about? And I started studying this workforce and then I became a professional speaker. And my goal was to change the way organization embrace generation inclusion. So I'm the G and I girl, I'm the generation inclusion girl. And so I went on the quest and I left my good government job, they would tell you, with all the perks, and, and I had everybody thought I was crazy, but I knew that I wanted to make an impact. So that I want to answer your question, impact and change the way the workforce is, and we are witnessing it right now. And I'm so glad that I was a part of that process. <laughs> you're right in the heart of it. Yes. Yeah, you're, you're definitely right, Tanya. Is that the workforce is changing rapidly, and I think uh, the entrepreneurs and business owners are feeling that. Uh, you know, in, in, um, in, you know, it's an incredible stress right now and a lot of things. And one of the biggest challenges, and we're seeing it right here with our own parent company, SRC mm -hmm. Holdings, is that there is this war for talent, as they say, right? And even at SRC, we have 100 job openings right now that, that we have posted. So, so from somebody that is coming here to make that impact and provides HR services and really understands those challenges well, I, I just wanted you to share with our listeners what are some of the things that they can do to attract and retain good people and win that war? You know, I'm so glad I'm, I'm so glad we're having this conversation. And I said something in 2018 and no one took me serious. And I said that the traditional workforce will have a war against the gig economy. And it is playing out before us very nicely. And what I mean about the gig economy, the freelancers, um, the ones that want to be solopreneurs now, they don't want traditional anymore. So what I say to entrepreneurs, and I, and I have experience, I, I can't find people as well too. So I'm suffering from that as well. But we said something last year at the Great Game of Business Conference, I spoke, is reimagine. 
It's time to reimagine the workforce. And it's not for corporate, it's for all of us. And what I mean by that, we really have to tap in on this notion of what's in it for me from, for the, from the employee perspective, right? And so even entrepreneurs, we can no longer, people are leaving traditional benefits, traditional management, traditional everything, right? So the blueprint right now, we have an opportunity, entrepreneurs out there have an opportunity to really create a blueprint because the blueprint that we have has been disrupt, disrupted. So what, what do I mean by that? So looking at how to attract talent, because really it's not a war on talent, it's a war on bringing and attracting talent to you, right? There's a difference, right? And so the question I did a survey, well, why don't people want to work for traditional organizations or just work in general? Last year, 4 million people resigned last year. So I call it the resignation era. So why? Hmm. 4 million in one month to say, you know what? I'm going to do my own thing, right? So I think we got some competition here. And I think one of the biggest employers is the government. I'm not trying to be political, but it's the government with all this, you know, stimulus help and all that doesn't help us. But aside from that, I think that we have four to five generations in the workplace with different purpose, different motivation of factor. And if we have not been flexible, we lose. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the that's the game. We lose. So the question is, what can I do to attract all of it? You're right. And it's no one size fit all. So, you know, we talk about, well, I give great benefits, but what kind of benefits are you given? You know, mm -hmm. what kind of perks you're given? So we got to look at it beyond the, just the medical, dental, and vision. What about elder care? We all had to deal with that last year. You know, what about, you know, um, the mental care? Now, we've been exposed and know that our employees are dealing with that, and some of us are dealing with that as well. We can't, we cannot lead like we used to. We've mm -hmm. got to have empathy. Empathy when we're leading, that's a core competency now. It's not you do as I say or what have you. You know, you have to lead with empathy. You have to be inclusive. We got a lot of stuff that's coming in the workplace, right? We, like I said, we got the oldest to the youngest. We got the traditionals are still here. And we got the Gen Z that they need us, right? And so do are we spending time developing this workplace? I always say that uh, professional development is important. But guess what? life skills training is the game changer. I mean, it really is. And you may say, I, got I don't have time to raise people. <laughs> well, I don't. I, I mean, you will say that. I don't have time to raise people, but the life skills, because life gets in the way. And so we got all of these different things that are playing our employees and we have to be created. So with a line, it has to be in alignment with our goals and vision and mission. That's why I love great games of business. I met Jack Stack on the golf course. And I'm like, I just think that he got, he got it right. And so I think we have to do something different. And I think it's going to be based on really where you're going and how you can allow people to, to go along with you. Traditional is not working anymore. Did that answer? I hope that answered your question. We can go I, think it, I think it does. And I want to jump ahead just a little bit because you're, you're bringing up that the idea of I heard what I heard was flexibility, being able to uh, uh, to address a lot of generations in the workforce. Um, but I'm curious, when you talk about Jack having it right, um, what are some of the elements about open book management or some of the principles and practices around open book management or great game of business that you you think kind of lend to us better addressing that those that generation? What are some of the things that come to mind? The first thing is transparency. Yeah. I mean, I think that he has a, he, his passions about people making them better comes through. Um, like I said, I met him in a conference when I was speaking and uh, we just kind of talked a lot. And I just love the fact that, you know, the way he formulates that transparency and then also making sure people are financially astute to what's going on. That right there was a game changer because if I can teach you about finances, when we have to make decisions, we don't have to hide it. We understand it. And so I really believe that Jack has done a great job with making sure employees are along the journey, ups and down, they're waving with you. And I love that because oftentimes, you know, I work with a lot of clients and, and things 
don't work in the in the favor and they shield it from employees because they think employees are going to leave but what they're learning now if you don't be transparent they still leave yeah. so <laughs> and so i i just think that it's a mind shift and i think you know jack got it right with the the mind shifting and being unapologetic about it which is important to me that's what i like mm -hmm. that's great wow. that's so good so um, I, I really love how you called yourself the generation and inclusion girl, because it's so big. I mean, it's like these are all the things we're talking about and and uh, the hot button topics of uh, diversity and inclusion are a part of that. Um, I just want to ask a few questions so that our listeners can can understand a little bit more about the definitions of these things. So diversity itself goes way beyond just checking the boxes on race, ethnicity, gender, right. etc. Um, talk a little bit about that, if you would, and then I have a follow-up for you as well. Well, I, I think we are in a global space right now. We are going to be diverse. It's just, it's just like brushing your teeth. It's just expected. That's what it is. And there's nothing wrong with it. I think we put so much emphasis on diversity. And so for me, when I think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, mm -hmm. if I didn't know you, know, you guys, you probably said, That's, that word sounds very compliant, right? And uh -huh. people don't want to talk about it. It's, and it's like, ooh, what is this? Here? It's, it's almost like you're making me do something that I really don't know if I really want to do it, right? So I come from an angle of generational inclusion, G and I, mm -hmm. because I think it's four different groups with different lenses come to work together. And some is, is difficult to embrace and some is not. But I think it's an easier conversation when I say, you know what, when you go to work every day, you're working with people from different backgrounds. It's still diversity. Um, so I, I, I frame it in, in such a way that it's like, yeah, that's relevant. Yeah, that's not so harsh now because now I'm not trying to throw nothing at you. I'm just showing you that it's already existed and we're, it's in our world and we just have to embrace it. That's, mm -hmm. that's, I try to keep it very simplistic. Well, I like that because it's a much friendlier conversation. It, it goes is. back to what you said about, you know, can we lead with empathy? So my follow-up is this. So a lot of people listening um, are, they share broad-based employee ownership. And, you know, Jack and, and SRC is uh, all about, uh, you know, 100% ESOP. We believe ESOP. in it. We, it changes lives. We see it every day. Now, equity out there in the world means something different. And could you... D d define what equity means versus equity ownership in a business. Okay, so when you think about equity, you're, you're going to hear disparity and compensation among race, when mm -hmm. I mean, when, um, gender, if you will, um, mm -hmm. access. Okay, that's what equity means, right? I had the opportunity in my early years of my career in college to participate in the ESOP program. That was the best thing I could have ever done. That's why I love ESOP. Um, I was a, I worked for an organization in my freshman year all the way to I graduate. So you can imagine I participate in the ESOP program. But what I quickly learned is that an ESOP is equity at yes. its finest, right? Mm -hmm. At its finest. And also it's, it's a deeper, I think, for organizations that are offering ESOP program, the playing field is so much better because now I'm giving you access. There's nothing to, to um, say that there's no, it's a disparity because again, when we went, when I, when the company went, everybody wins. And that's right. what I love about it. Everyone wins and you get to participate. So now it, it breaks, it breaks those barriers, you know, of, you know, of um, not having equity among your compensation. You see a lot of equity issues or challenges among compensation, if you will you know, those kind of things. But I think this is the ESOP programs are great programs. And I think it's one of the programs that's been around for a long time. I definitely would encourage employees, uh, employers, I should say, to consider often it as a benefit because this new generation right now, um, when they think about ownership, because um, there's a difference between a, a 401k retirement plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's about positioning, terminology. So when they think about retirement, they think in 60, 70 years old, right? And they can't see that far. They only can see 30 days, right? Yeah. And so when you talk about um, ESOP, you shift the conversation. Let me just give you an example. I got two boys, got a millennial and a Gen Z. They are the future of our workplace. 
millennials represent the largest population in the workplace. So we got to look at benefits that's going to attract them. That go back to that tracking. Mm -hmm. But terminology, they don't like, like, for example, a saving account. They think it's for old people. And when you get old, that's when you use it. I use an example for my son, Bryce. Bryce is a Gen Z. I said, Bryce, I need you to save money. Oh, he was not hearing me, right? I said, Bryce, you need to, he has his own business. You need to start saving money. That means old. He thinks I'm old. So something said to me, let me just change the terminology, right? Term, terminology. I said, Bryce, how much are you worth? I said, so let's put away your worth. And that clicked with him. He, he wrote a check for a large amount and put it because he see value in that right now because he feel like he's worse. So I had to flip the script and change the mindset. So for those out there that are contemplating or do have the ESOP program, it's a branding piece. It's about mm -hmm. being a part of something. It's ownership, right? Yep. And so I think we have to brand all of our benefits. We have to brand everything that we do because we got a, a population or a workforce that drives on branding. Mm -hmm. For sure. I love it. Speak the different language. Speak that at, language. at SRC, uh, we, we often uh, shift the the conversation to wealth generation rather mm -hmm. than just retirement because different generations respond differently as you've just pointed out i love your terminology that's cool i, I do love that approach of just uh is is, is to give the owners and the, uh, the business people uh, different tactics to be able to create that conversation and i'm curious about that back on our conversation of kind of attracting that new workforce you mentioned transparency as being one of those those principles and practices of great game that can help with that. But traditionally uh, for business owners, that has been an area that they're very uncomfortable about, right? Yeah. Financial transparency education. Is there any techniques there in changing the conversation to get owners to embrace that kind of thing? Or is it going to just be pure millennials are going to come in and say, I'm going to demand it, or I'm walking out the door, that kind of thing. What's going to change that? I was just curious about your thoughts on how to get the entrepreneur or the business owner to change their behavior and their thinking about that. I think it's how we recruit. Mm -hmm. I think it's how we onboard. For example, I, cast, I, I hired someone and I cast my vision. I gave, I was very transparent about what the goals I want from a, a monetary standpoint, because oftentimes we don't talk about, you know, this is the goal to have the revenue. I wanted them to be a part of that, right? So I opened up my um, onboarding process with this new hire about, yes, I talked about core values or whatever, but I said, I'm looking for people that's want to be a part of every aspect and every leg of the way of my success. And I said, this is from the financial bucket. This is what I'm looking for. For each bucket, I told them things that they uh, traditionally probably wouldn't have said, you know, mm -hmm. but I said those things. And what she told me, she said, I believe in you. And I really want to be a part of your process. She said, yes, you were, you know, you're a smaller company. She said, but I just felt your energy and I felt your authenticity and your transparency. And I would say months when we are low, hey, we didn't do well this month. What do you suggest we need to do? Right. Mm -hmm. So not, I couldn't offer ESOP programs to them, but I could offer an ESOP environment. Yeah. It's about mm -hmm. the culture, you know, so, you know, employee ownership of the culture. And so, and even from the finance things, the things that we don't want to talk about as business owners that we had a bad month and it doesn't look well, but we still believe, right. And we're still transparent. And so, when you do that, because I believe the workforce today is looking for purpose and we got to give them an opportunity to have purpose. And you do that by having these authentic, inclusive, transparent conversation, mm -hmm. you know, so it's an exchange because I believe that the employer and the employee relationship has changed. Mm -hmm. Right. We cannot continue to do the same thing, you know, not tell people we're not doing well. Now, some of you may say. Well, if I tell them that we didn't make payroll or we are struggling with payroll, will they leave? I still think it's how you bring in and how you position it, you know, and you want to let them know, you know, oftentimes when we have to make difficult decisions, they don't know why, you know, and I think once they know why, then they can better understand because, you know, I had a client right now, they're really struggling. 
Um, they can't give you know raises the way they want to because they didn't do a good job with um, their pricing. You know when they have contracts, they didn't budget it for it correctly. So you can't go back to the client and say I need more money or what have you. So that's a mistake they made, right? And so I'm not saying that you go and say, hey, we had some incompetent leaders is that, you know, we didn't forecast like we needed to. That's much better than saying we don't have money to give raises, you Mm -hmm. know. So I think you can frame those conversations in such a way, layman terms, where people feel that you're telling the truth, you're transparent, but this is what this is our plan of action. I just think you just have to have authentic, inclusive conversation about the business, about everything. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, Tanya, I want to ask this, you know, I, there are a lot of catchphrases out there, a lot of them, you know, it's like, we have more in common than we do not in common. And, and I don't want, I'm not being flippant. I, what I really want to do is maybe you, you talk with so many organizations, what are some ways that uh, our listeners uh, can make sure that everyone feels included? Well, I think I talked early on about empathy, but I do feel that there's a piece that we miss and I call it dibs. Dibs. D-I-B-S, dibs. So we know diversity is, we're going to be there. We're going to have diversity of thought, gender, race, so on. Then we know inclusion is a big piece. We want to be very inclusive. What that means is that we want to kind of include everyone. But the, the game changer is belonging. That's where the B comes from, mm-hmm. belonging. So for those who are out there listening, ask yourself, why would an employee feel like they belong in this organization? What mm-hmm. have I done? What have I offered to make someone feel every day they can get up and belong here? You have no control of diversity. It's going to be there. We do want you to be inclusive, but ultimately the game changer is belong. And I always say this when I do a lot of my speeches, can we all get along so we all can belong? <laughs> and I really mean that because there are some people, generation and employees that are isolated right now. Mm-hmm. You got older people that may feel isolated because we're moving too fast for technology. You got a younger generation may say, nobody's explaining nothing to me. They don't want to, and I don't feel belong. And so every spectrum, there's an element of belonging that's missing. Got it. Okay. Don't leave me hanging now. Really, <laughs> I, I heard dibs. Is there an S? Yes, it is on it. Belongings. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I thought there was D-I-B-S. So what I love about this is we were just talking about really, if I could paraphrase it, an ownership culture, right? At your company, uh, you may not have employee ownership because of the size of your company, but I, I think ownership starts here, you know, in the heart and the head before it hits the wallet. So This uh, belonging, though, I just would like to state that when we think about Maslow's hierarchy of need, Mm -hmm. as soon as you said it, I thought, man, that's great because it's way down right above survival, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it's it's basic. I can't really be my best creative self until I feel like I belong. And when you read about things uh, in society, you know, people will belong anywhere. If they don't have a good home life, they might join a a gang or they might go Uh, hang Absolutely. out with the wrong people. So why why can't they belong here? Uh, I love that. That's that really well, speaks to ownership. You really hear this terminology, which really gets under my skin. Bring your whole self. You mm-hmm. guys heard. Bring your whole self to work. Well, if you are not, if you don't have inclusive leaders, if you don't have a culture that is inclusive, it's hard to do that. You know, and so that's why. I do a lot of diversity work with organizations, not just to check the box, but to create a culture that's a business price, it's a business case for it. But mm-hmm. ultimately, if you want to attract employees, if you want to retain employees, they, you have to get outside the box and do things, different benefits, things you would have never thought of. You have to survey your workforce to determine what it is they want. Don't assume. And then you have a panel of people that make those decisions if you can. Look at how you want your employees to come to work and feel like they belong. What does that look like? Because it's different for everyone. And so I think when we start, when we are seeing it now because it used to be, you know, you know, COVID had us thinking that, you know, everybody had to be in the office. We all quickly became a software company, meaning that <laughs> we had to use Zoom and WebEx and everything. We became a software company. So it's not a matter if, it's, you know, it's not when, it's now. 
And yeah. so we are forced to do things different than we would have never thought of. And so I, my goal and my heart is to bring back, I shouldn't say bring back, reimagine the workplace for the future where everyone feel like they belong. I don't think that we can push, we have to push boomers out or what. I think there's a place for every generation as long as they can feel like they belong. Good God, I hope so, Tanya. <laughs> it, it is, but you know what? We just gotta have more conversation. We got we talk, we we need to talk to one another and not talk at each other. Understand what the trigger, the triggers are, you know, because many of us, we got children, and like I, I spoke two years ago at the, the great game of um, business, and we talked about, you know, as baby boomers, sometimes with the younger generation come in, there are some triggers that take us back if we have children and we go right into mommy and daddy mode quick absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so we just have to make sure we understand that there are some different perspectives in the workplace now <laughs> well tanya I th I'm, I'm i'm thinking about our listeners right now and there's probably some listeners that are saying okay i get that i i do have this challenge that i need to attract and retain my people but how do i do that can you explain a little bit of how you what is your process? What are some of the things people could do to learn how to go about changing that culture and changing the way they even think about, you know, uh, that in their workplace? I'm just uh, under, trying to understand the how. Okay, so and, and it's good that you asked that question because what's unique about the services that we offer, we come from an HR background, so we know people, okay? Mm -hmm. D&I is just a process. So typically I help organizations that do not know where to start. Like, I don't know what all this stuff is all about. So we take them to their reality. We have a four-step process where we do an assessment of your reality. It's a DNI assessment or a culture climate survey. And that's the first thing is assessing where you are, okay, taking that data. And then we work with the leadership team to strategize and get, to strategize of where the goals are going to be around, you know, the DNI goals around our business goals. Then we mobilize, meaning that we start getting our leadership on board. You got to start talking and facilitating with your leaderships, doing focus group, make sure they have awareness. And then the, the fourth piece is implementation is where we do a lot of um, facilitated dialogues. I call them brave conversations. I don't like to assume that I can do a PowerPoint presentation and everybody gets it. Mm -hmm. I want a group of people that's coming to the, to the, um, the workshop got their own opinion we're going to agree to the disagree but we're going to listen learn and unlearn some things and that is the best way to be able to, to begin the process of changing to an inclusive culture it is not a marathon it's a process people are going to bring what they know and it's okay but we have to share and understand we got to be heard so that's how i do it <laughs> thank you for that Tonya, um, beyond running your own company and speaking nationally and all these kinds of things, you you co-authored the book Compassion in the Workplace, and you wrote the book um, before you say I do to entrepreneurship. Can you talk about your books and tell us where our listeners can find them? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so the first book, um, The Compassion in the Workplace, which was co-authored with some um, different authors, mm -hmm. and I, the reason why we collaborate on this book because I knew the workplace was comprised of four to five generation. And so my, my chapter is compassion on um, one generation at a time. And I just believe that we lost compassion. We have more, we have no um, patience for anybody pretty much. We're fast moving in a hurry. And so I wanted us to get back to passion because I think that um, we all need it at some level. So that's why I wrote that co-author that book. But the one that you know I really love is before I say I do to entrepreneurship. Um, <laughs> apart, <laughs> apart from my my HR consultant and management training program, I have a coaching program that a lot of um, employees are transitioning and don't they don't know how to transition out, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just thought about you know what I need to use the marriage analogy because it's almost like flirting and dating, you know, with this, this special guy or a special woman. And I take you through a process of dating and, you know, before you got married. It's the same thing with entrepreneurship. For example, when I before I transitioned out, you know, I, I, I was interested in entrepreneurship, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> so I start dating it, meaning that, you know, I would go to conferences. I, I was just really intrigued, right? And so I found myself getting, I mean, and I flirted with it a little bit. So I talked about how you flirt with it a little bit. You mean like some aspects of it, but not all the aspects. It was a fun book, all the aspects of it. But then when I finally realized, I really like this here. That's just like, I see this guy. I really like, like my husband, Kevin. Oh, I really like Kevin, right? So I think I'm going to be really serious about Kevin, right? I'm going to do all the right things to keep Kevin attracted to me. And I'm attracted to Kevin. I did the same thing with entrepreneurship. And then I talked about when we get engaged is building people around you to make sure you can be successful. And then you just say, I do, you get the marriage license, which is a registration license to your business. So I just take you through that whole process. And I, I mean, I, it, it was a thought and I said, oh, this sounds really good. It's not boring. So I just take you through my journey. And then I talk about in the marriage and when you're doing, um, when you're married for a couple you know, years or whatever long it takes, sometimes you need counseling, right? And I also say you need coaching in your business to go to the next level, right? So I just took you through the whole um, analogy of how you can transition from working for someone to working for yourself, but using it from an um, entrepreneur route to a marriage route. Very good. So I wonder could, if you can get a prenup with entrepreneurship. <laughs> well, you know what? <laughs> I, I do talk about that in there as well, how that works too. So I, I mean, seriously, I took you to, a, I've been married for 27 years and I use some of my analogies, you know, how my husband and I met and how the business aspect, because it took me five years to determine it if I wanted to transition, but I prepared, you know, I did the networking stuff. I, I built relationships. I got all the certification. I got all the things I need. I was getting ready for this big day, mm -hmm. you know, the marriage day. So when I transitioned, that was the day I said, I do. <laughs> it's great it's and so great. you can find that on amazon or you can go to my website um it is um simply hrinc.com but it's on amazon both of them oh that's great great <laughs> well we we usually wrap up our podcast by asking um what what is one question we should be asking you right now what have we missed well, I think you are, you're, you're very inclusive in your questions, but I think what we should be talking about is what organizations should be doing to attract the new future workplace. And, and, and I, I think that we're trying to figure it out because, you know, many of us, especially in the HR world, you know, we do a lot of HR outsourcing as well. They are dealing with the COVID the return back to work, the policies around that, right? And we get so caught up in all of that and we're still trying to keep the doors open. Yeah. And then this DNI piece that is, some people thought it would go away, but it is, it's a new conversation. Um, people are now being very open about a lot of stuff. And so now the conversations are here. And so the question is, how do we have a workforce where we can bring some of this stuff in the workplace, you know, and talk about it, but not so much just talking about it. What are we doing from a small organization to a large organization or uh, a business is what are you doing to ensure employees feel like they're in the right place? Because this new generation right now, they are all about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this should be top of mind. It should be in your interviewing process. It should be all over the place, your, your vendors. Your suppliers, now they're asking about what are you doing from a diversity, equity, and inclusion standpoint. So it is a fiber of our organization. So I would say to the listeners out here, get to know how DNI is a business case. It is not something we just talking about. It is not this foo-foo, nice stuff, and it's going to blow away. It should be the fabric of the new workforce. Mm -hmm. So good. Well, Listen, I, I, there's so much good stuff here. You probably have seen me writing feverishly trying to keep up, but I, I always like to uh, kind of do a quick sum up to see if I really caught all the, the good stuff that, uh, that you've been sharing with us, Tanya. So some of the things that I picked up, not necessarily in order, but how I absorbed them. Uh, first of all, I really love the way you kind of come at it from generation and inclusion. It's a much friendlier conversation versus a compliance conversation. Um, also love lead with empathy and compassion. Take your team along you, with you on the journey. Uh, benefits, instead of assuming the old stuff works, why don't we ask what they want? Don't assume anything. Maybe it's something different than what we thought it was. And maybe talk with each other instead of at 
each other about all of these very touchy, very sensitive topics. And then um, for, uh, I think for me, the big one was the game changer, as you mentioned, it dibs, diversity, inclusion, and here it is, folks, belonging. It's all about culture, create a culture of, uh, of belonging. I think that's a great way to think about this. So you got a lot of good stuff here, plus the books, Compassion in the Workplace, before I say I do to entrepreneurship. Um, Tanya Morris, it's been great. Uh, we'll make sure that people know that, that they can find you at simplyhrinc.com. Uh, wow, thank you for this time. Really appreciate I, it. I, I, appre I appreciate it. I, I'm always uh, open for a good conversation. I will be at the conference this year. I'm going to speak. All right. And uh, probably do some more work, you know, with SRC as well. But yeah, I, if anybody, you know, I would love to talk to people when I get there in Dallas and um, I'm passionate about this and I'm really big on making impact in today's workplace. I think we just have to think a little bit different and shift the mindset. Do business good. differently. Yes. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks, Tanya, for helping us change the game. Yes, so right. folks, let's, let's keep the conversation going. Send us your questions, your stories, your best practices, ideas, challenges, and of course, your victories. That is capitalism at its best. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.